Hi everyone, John here. Welcome back to another tutorial. This time I'm going to break down this look, which is my homage to Starship Troopers, one of my all time favorite sci fi films. I got some inspiration from a poster for the film and I thought I'd try and recreate it. And I've done all the compositing and After Effects using Sapphire and Continuum. So let's take a look. Now I know this is an After Effects tutorial. But I just wanted to talk a little bit about how I created the model and how I textured it. I actually modeled this in Blender and it was quite successful to do it in Blender. Some of you might know that I switched to Blender about a year ago from Cinema 4D and I'm really enjoying the modeling and the general workflow in Blender. And it was unwrapped in Ryzen UV. Ryzen UV is my favorite tool for unwrapping UVs very fast. And it was textured in Substance Painter. Always love jumping back into Substance Painter, especially texturing your own models. It's so much fun, especially uh, you know when you get to do a little bit of gore as well, which is um, something I don't normally get to do. Now, in order to bring that into After Effects, and we're talking about the After Effects beta here, you can import 3D models into the After Effects beta. And I was planning to export to GITF format out of Blender, but I realized pretty quickly that Blender actually can't export UDIMs. So the plan was to do it in Blender, texture it in Substance, and then bring it back to Blender Subdivide and then export out of Blender. But I wasn't able to do that. So I actually ended up exporting directly out of Substance Painter, which worked perfectly. And that was just a case of going up to the file menu and choosing Export Textures and just choosing the GITF PBR metal roughness format. And I exported at 4096, just exported like that and just imported directly into After Effects. So let's go into After Effects and break this down. Now I've got a proxy rendered here just to make the preview a little faster. Although it was a fairly fast render, it's amazing how fast this 3D model does render in After Effects. And you can see at the beginning, the camera starts fairly close and it's fairly dark, pretty much in silhouette. And as the camera pulls back, the helmet becomes illuminated and we can see a little more detail. And the title comes in and the tagline as well. Now the title and the tagline are both using After Effects 3D text. Let's start with the 3D model. So I'll just open up the model comp and as I mentioned, this is GITF format. Literally just drag and drop into After Effects and everything's in there. Textures and also it appears to be illuminated by an HDRI. I'm not actually sure whether that's the HDRI I used in Substance Painter. I don't think so. I think it's just a, a standard HDRI. I have no idea, but um, I'm actually using the After Effects lights. So they're illuminating it at the moment. But if I turn those off, you can see it is actually illuminated. So leave a comment if you have any more information about how GITF format works. It doesn't matter for me anyway because I wanted to use the After Effects lights. Now I'll leave those off for a moment. We'll just talk about the camera first. The actual model itself isn't animating. It's just the camera that's doing all the animation. I've got a camera and I've got an orbit null and for beginners, if I right click and choose camera, you can choose to create orbit null and that's what I've done. So the reason I do that is because it makes animating the camera easier and more predictable. So if I press U to reveal the keyframes, the camera is animated on the Z axis and the orbit null is animated on the X and Y and also Y rotation for the orbit. So the Z axis animation is giving us the dolly. In this case, we're pulling out, so we're dollying out. And the position is just, there's just a couple of position keyframes in there for X and Y, just to make sure it stays in the center. And the Y rotation is doing the orbiting. So we're starting basically on the side, and we're pulling back, and we end up in this sort of hero pose. And if you have a look at the value graph, you can see we're just easing into a nice stop there. Same. Here, if we have a look at the camera Z position, again, we're just easing in. 
Okay, so that's the camera. Let's take a look at the lights. Now, as we saw before, at the very beginning, we're starting in darkness or, or semi-silhouette. And to do that, I've used a couple of parallel lights. Let's go to two views. And we've got a top view here. So I'll just turn on back left. And watch what happens to the illumination when I do that. Okay, so now we're using After Effects lights. So this is a parallel light. And you can see the point of interest is pretty much in the middle of the model. And just press U to reveal the keyframes. We've got a couple of keyframes there. We've got a couple of keyframes for position. So as the camera does its thing, the light is also moving. So what's happening here is I'm also animating the intensity of the light. So it's pretty much in darkness at the start. Later on, we'll look at the flares that I've used. And the idea is that the flares are the sun and it's starting uh, not so bright at the start and then it gets brighter. So I wanted to match the lighting, the After Effects lighting with the brightness of the flares. So it starts in darkness and as the camera pulls back, the intensity increases. But notice how you can see here, this edge here, notice how it doesn't really increase. We're not actually starting to illuminate more of the front of the model. That's because I'm actually animating the light's position back behind the model just to keep that illuminated area about the same size. It gets a little wider as the model rotates or as the camera orbits around. But it's not like the light is, you know, right in the front here and revealing a lot of the of the model, the front of the model. I still wanted to keep these lights just, you know, as rim lights. So just adjusting the position so that it suits the position of the camera. That's nice. We get that little ping off the off the bug's leg as well. Like that, really nice. Now I also needed to illuminate the right hand side, so I used another parallel light. And you can see this is actually a little more illumination because this is the side where the light source is. So this one actually is animating as well, but this one is actually animating forward and around to the front. So it's revealing more of the side because there's also this, this nice detail here as well. Looks really nice. So as the camera pulls back, that light, you can see it's moving around and just revealing a little bit more. We get this lovely fall off here. And if I just press U, you can see we're also animating the intensity. One thing I didn't do here was ease the intensity in. So I probably should just use my keyframe assistant and easy ease into that. Okay, that's looking really nice. Now, speaking of fall off, I was going to use parallel lights for everything because I really like the way parallel lights work. But in this current version, this current build of the After Effects beta, parallel lights fall off is not, isn't working. And I wanted uh, to use fall off as well, but I couldn't use it uh, with parallel lights. So it didn't really matter for the backlights, but it did matter for the spotlights. And these are being used to illuminate the front of the model so that we can see what it is when it pulls back into position or when the camera pulls back into position. You can see there's one on the right hand side there and I just press U. You can see that's a spotlight and I'm animating the radius. So in this case I'm not animating the intensity because I tried it with parallel light animating intensity and I wasn't able to get the nice sort of fall off effect because fall off wasn't working. So that's why I chose to use a spotlight in this case. And in the end, the results looks nice anyway, so it didn't really matter. But if you're wondering why fall off's not working with parallel lights currently, that's, that's why, because it's a, it's a known bug. So that's really nice. You can see how that's starting to illuminate that. And we're getting this, still this fall off into darkness. So that's that one on that side. We've got one on the other side. This is more towards the front. So, you know, illuminating this area here. Turn that on and off like that. And we've got one more. And uh, this one is just illuminating down this he here, this chin strap and the, you know, the, the sharp part of the bug's leg, the pointy bit, the dangerous bit. 
So it's just eliminating that a little bit because otherwise that was in too much darkness. But as you can see, I haven't over illuminated the model. It's a trap to fall in when you start modeling and you know lighting your models to want to over illuminate the thing just to show off what you've modeled. It's what's more important is using the lighting to tell a story. And if I'd have just blown this out with lights, there's no way it would have had the moodiness that I would intended it to have. So I'm using the lighting to tell the story. And notice also, just finally, if I just double click on that light, you can see it's a slightly warm light. And a slightly warm light there. And the same for there, because the final look is going to be really warm. So I thought I could start adding a little bit of warmth by making those lights warm. And the backlights as well. All right, so that's the lighting in the camera. Now let's take a look at the flares. So I'm just going to turn off this proxy. And what I'll also do with this model layer selected is just come up to the effect control panel and just turn off BCC plus film stocks. Okay, we'll talk about the grade in a moment. So let's talk about the flares. The first are these two down here, 10 and 11. This is flare three and four. And just very simple flares. These are sapphire lens flare. And we'll go to number four first. And I'm just going to click to edit lens. Now, what I've done with the flares is I've split them across multiple After Effects layers. The main reason I've done that is because I wanted to have a couple of the elements in front of the model and other elements behind. And the first one here, you can see, really only has the hotspot turned on. So what I've done is I've chosen a preset, I think it might have been Desert Sun, and I've just turned off the elements that I didn't need. So that was that first one. And for the second one, on top of that, I've done the same thing. Let me just edit lens again. Same thing. Turned everything off, left hotspot turned on. So I could have combined them both by using the lens editor and building that, but it was just much faster for me just to grab the, the preset that I wanted, turn off the bits that I didn't want, and just move on. So that's the back. And if we just select those two layers, let's grab them both and press U, you can see I've animated the brightness. Remember I talked before about with the After Effects lighting, having the intensity right down low and then increasing the intensity and changing the position of the lights and then adding the spotlights and animating the radius. That's all aligned in time with the brightness animation of these flares. So as the flares get brighter, we see you know, more light behind the model and also you know, more light in front. Obviously, the light behind wouldn't illuminate the front of the model. If anything, it would put it into more silhouette, but I have to have something lighting the front, otherwise it'll remain in silhouette the whole time. Okay. So, you know, pretty simple. Now, you might notice here that the hotspot, hotspot XY, has, you know, red numbers, and that's because there's an expression applied. And it's basically linked to this null object. Because I've used multiple flares on multiple layers, I wanted to link the hotspot so that if I move the null, then all of the hotspots move. So they're all in register. Otherwise, if I move the position of the hotspot for one, I've got to you know, update all the other ones. Okay, so that's flares three and four. Let's drop the model in front here. Next, I'm going to turn on flare two. All right, now we can't see flare two yet. Why is that? That's because I've used occlusion. What's happening is here, I'm using the 3D model as the occlusion layer for that flare. And if we have a look under occlusion from layer, you can see I've chosen the model. Now, this is really good because it makes it look realistic. And also I wanted to make it look different from the poster that I use as reference. Let's take a look at that poster. So there's the reference poster. It's from the 90s. It looks pretty retro. Uh, but this was the initial inspiration. But notice with the flare, it's also a very retro looking flare. Notice how it's all behind 
the objects. You know, now in reality, this part of the flare would be in front of the objects. So as the light peaks in front, you'd actually see that in front. And I wanted to do that. I didn't want to have the 3D object sitting on top of the flare because not only does it not look real, it also makes it look very flat. So that's why I split it up and put these in front. Let's just come back to here, turn these ones on. And Flare 1 is also using the model as the occlusion layer. And this is really nice. See how that is right in front of the model now? And it really gives us a lot of depth. We just move back. It's not until the camera hits a certain point that that flare gets revealed. So occlusion can be really important when you're trying to create realistic flares. Now, if I wanted to reposition the whole thing, just grab my hotspot and I could just put that somewhere else. You see, it's still using the 3D layer. So as I move it, it's still using that 3D layer for occlusion. So no matter where I put it, those front two flares will only appear when they're not covered by the 3D model. So you can see by linking all four flares hotspot X, Y to the null, can save me loads of time. I'm going to undo that. Okay, so now that the flares are in place, you can see they're quite warm and it's really adding sort of the main color to the composition. So now let's take a look at BCC film stocks and how I've used that to give the model the color grade. Now, I'm actually a big fan of drag and drop color grading effects. So for this one, I've used Continuum's film stocks effect and it's very easy to use. Just select the model. And I'm going to turn that on. You can see how that makes that nice and warm. I'll just twirl that open and click on the effects editor. We can take a look at the presets. Film stocks comes with a lot of presets. So basically all I did here was just look through the presets to find something fairly warm. And I'm pretty sure I used one of these Royal Tenenbaum ones. I think it was maybe this one. And it just came in and just tweak the settings a little bit, come down to the filter here. Filter actually had a opacity of zero, I just increased that amount and just dialed into what I needed. Got pretty close in the preset editor, just going to cancel that. And then just coming into the effect and just making any minor adjustments here. One thing to point out here is that Filmstocks has a sharpen option in there. So with the sharpen option is really nice. Just you know, sharpened everything up a little bit. And I thought that actually made quite a difference. You can see how soft it is without it. Very nice. So like I said, drag and drop film grading effects, color grading effects, big fan. All right, so next let's take a look at how I did the titles and the tagline. So for the text, I've used After Effects 3D text. And I've actually set up the title inside its own pre-comp because I wanted to use individual lighting for the title. Let's go into that comp. And we'll start here at the bottom. So this is the Starship Troopers title. And the font is called Uni Wars. It's an Adobe font. I really like this font. It's got a, a nice sort of retro feel, but not too retro. I looked at a whole bunch of different ones. And this, this seemed to be the best one, especially because it looks sci-fi, but without being too retro. And it's also pretty easy to read, which I thought was good, especially since I'm only using the bevel, the 3D bevel. I'm not using the fill or the sides of the text. So great font for this. Now, if I press UU on the keyboard, we can see everything that's changed on there. Let's take a look at these three. Notice how they're capital letters. I've renamed these. These three here are animator groups, okay? So the first one I've named opacity and inside there, are three options, front, side, and back opacity. So once I created the animator group, I just added the various opacity options for front, side, and back. And you can see I've made them zero. And by doing that, I've now only got the bevel visible because I only wanted the bevel. And let me just click on this side here. And you can see, we can see straight through that. If I just, for example, increase front opacity, there we go, then that's back there. I did play around with having, you know, fully opaque 3D text, but I ended up hitting on 
the idea of using just the bevel. Now for the bevel, I've used a concave bevel. We'll come back to these in a moment. But if we have a look under geometry options, you can see the bevel style is concave. And I really like that because I've used a light behind the text. That's this quite warm light. And you can see how it's being picked up on the concave part of the bevel, which is really nice. If I just change that, watch what happens to the text. So this is angular. So not quite as strong, right? And this is convex. A little better, but not quite as nice as using concave. So I'm going to bring that back. Very nice. I think that was the best option there. We'll look at the light in a moment. Now, the next is Bevel Specular. So this is another animator group. And you can see I've just adjusted the specular intensity of the bevel. I'll bring that down to zero. It makes it really flat, right? So if I just turn that off, that's how it looked, okay? So just by adding a bit of bevel specular intensity, just brightened up those bevels. Very nice. And the last one is scale. So this is what's creating the animation. And one thing to keep in mind is with the text, under animate, notice how I've got enable per character 3D checked. And what that's allowing me to do with this scale animator group, so that's this one here, scale, it's allowing me to scale the text, if I just twirl it open, only on one axis. So you can see, if I start at the beginning, the x-axis is at zero. So we're only animating on the x-axis, and that's what's scaling the text up. So this is kind of a... Uh, a sort of classic reveal for a sci-fi title, scaling it that way. I did try doing a rotation, but I just didn't like the way it looked. So a few different animator groups there, added by just choosing them from the pop-up menu here to control how the text looks. Let's take a look at the lights. So if we turn the lights off, That's how the text looks. It doesn't look very good, does it? Now I'm going to turn on the backlight first. So this is this light here. Uh, now you can really see how that's affecting the bevel. Now notice there's a motion path. So what I've done is I've animated the position on the X so that it moves along the text. You can see it highlights the text as it moves along. This makes it look a little more interesting. And it also actually works really nicely with the glare effect, the sapphire glare effect we'll look at in a moment. Now, to actually make sure that we can see the text properly, I've used a couple of other lights. Just front left and front right. I'll just turn those on. I'll just turn on front, let's see, front right first. Okay, so just pointing right at the middle of the text, the point of interest, and another one on the left. And together, I think one of them is a little blue. This one's white, the one on the right. That's the fill. And the main light, the key light, is blue, the one on the left. And together they get kind of a, you know, a gunmetal gray or a steel gray look. And that's, that's kind of what I was going for. Okay, so the only other thing I've added in here is just a null object. And I just parented everything to the null, which just allowed me to reposition the text looking at the uh, text, the title in the main comp, just to make sure I got it in the right position. But by adding it to a null or parenting it to a null, just means that I can grab the null, I just turn it on, and just move it up, and watch how the lights and everything move together. So I could reposition the text, and I'm not going to mess up my lighting. So that's, that's why I added that too. And I always give it a name like position control or rotation control. Okay. I'm just going to bring it back to one view here. Let's take a look at the glare. So this is an adjustment layer, and this is sapphire glare. Pretty classic effect. And I created some presets for this some time ago, and they're available inside S-Glare. Let's just load the preset. If you look at, you know, one in five trailers or two in five, or maybe even more at the moment when it has 3D text, you're going to see little, little um, you know, pinpointed flares or glares on the text. It's really popular. And sapphire glares are a really nice way to do that. 
And that's why I created a few presets in here for that purpose. They're, these ones here, Subtle Glare 1. Let's turn these on. See, Subtle Glare 1, 2, 3, 4. There's a few in there. And I grab one of those. We just go in there and click on Edit Style. This will open up the Flare Editor. We can make some adjustments. And here, all I've done is I've just adjusted the rel width. You can see, just bring that down. It was a little round to start with. I just made it a little more anamorphic, just so it sort of hugged the, uh, the, the outline of the text a bit better. Going to cancel that. And because I've animated the light, and glare is working on the brightest areas of the text, as the light moves across, and the glare also moves across. You can see how it starts over here. And as the light moves across, we get the glares moving across the text, which I thought was quite nice. You don't really have a lot of control over where the glares are uh, doing it this way. But um, I thought this was pretty good and it didn't need to have you know, specific control where those glares appeared. Now for the tagline, I've also created that inside its own comp because I wanted to light that individually as well. Let's take a look at that. I'll just close this one up. And here's the tagline text. Now this is a different font. This font is Axia, Axia Light. Thought that worked quite well at a small size, but it still looks you know, fairly sci-fi like. And you can see here, I'm not using just the bevel. I'm using the front and the sides as well. It's really got a, only a very slight bevel to it. And there's a few lights in there. There's the backlight. Same thing, it's giving it that warm backlight, but notice how the backlight's lower than the text. The idea being that the illumination is coming from the sun and the sun is below the text. And there's a front and a left light. So you've got the blue one and the one on the right is the white one, giving it that sort of gray finish. And the animation is the same, just animating the source text animator group, scale X, and revealing the text that way. So pretty simple. If we come back to the main comp, both the tagline and the title have the BCC Plus video glitch applied. And if we just find a frame where we can see that, there we go. Just using one of the presets to give it that nice little glitchy effect. One of the fine block shift presets that I created. And the same for the tagline, not too much. I think for the tagline, what I actually did was I actually keyframed it. So we get a little bit of that glitchiness, glitchiness when the text appears, but you can see I've got a couple of whole keyframes here so that after a few frames, that glitchiness turns off. I think you can overdo video glitchiness. Okay, so that's pretty much everything other than a few adjustment layers just to finish off the look. Let's take a look at those. This is looking pretty nice, but the overall grade needed more contrast. Uh, and I took a little bit of inspiration from the original poster. You can see it's, it's quite rich and quite a lot of contrast. So just turn these off again. And this one. If we turn on this effect, this is Sapphire Film Effect. Once again, a nice useful sort of drag and drop grading effect. I literally just drag that on. And I got that look and I was pretty happy. I don't think I actually changed any of the settings from the default effect. I'm not using any glow or any grain or anything to do with the fields in here, just the standard uh, settings. And that made that nice and rich. And I thought that was just right. See, that makes a big difference. On top of that is Sapphire Ultra Glow, one of my favorite glow effects. And you can see, when we turn that on, we're just getting a little bit of glow because the threshold's been quite heavily adjusted. A little bit of glow in the brightest areas here on the bug's leg and mainly on the, on the flare here. Very nice. And a little bit on the side. So once again, another effect that can be overdone is glow. And the last effect I added right at the very, very end is the new Continuum Super LED effect. Just to give it more of a sort of a video screen kind of feel, let me just turn that on and look at the difference. 
So that's with Super LED turned on. And I've got a very small LED size. You can see I've also used a staggered effect, staggered in rows. And I've also used the key light part because because I noticed this was giving this more like a more of a graphic look. And part of that is due to the key light effect. If I just turn that on and off, take a look. So that's off. It's very subtle. Have a look at these areas here and here. With key light on, it just brightens those up. And it's helping give it more of a sort of comic book style look. And I really like that. I wasn't sure about this treatment, but I thought in the end, it makes it look a little more like um, we're viewing this through a video screen and kind of added to the look. The other thing about Super LED that was really useful for this is that video glitch is built in and also prism. So I'm using some subtle prism, so some RGB separation. And you can see that there a little bit, especially in the LEDs. And I'm also using some very subtle glitch. I've got intensity down to 20, but it's just adding a little bit of overall glitch over the whole thing. Once again, very easy to overdo that kind of thing. And you probably already noticed it, but one thing I haven't mentioned is the background, and that's using Sapphire Night Sky. You can see I've already got it turned on. I'll just solo that. Anytime I need some sort of starry night sky, Sapphire Night Sky is the first thing I turn to because Literally, I apply the effect and then I just move on because it just looks so good. Especially because it has like um, built-in glare and also has the ability to twinkle the stars as well, which I've knocked right back. But just worked perfectly in this scene. Just dropped it in and I was ready to go. So that's my animated poster homage to Starship Troopers. I hope you found that enjoyable. If you have a question, leave a comment. You can also join us on our Discord channel where we can go into more detail. For now, this is John from Boris Effects. I'll see you in the next tutorial.